Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all today? I'm super glad that you are here today. I don't know about you, but everywhere I went this week, I, and I asked how someone was doing. They were either had been sick, or they were sick, or they're probably going to be sick. So I am so glad that you're here today, and I hope that you are feeling well. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is, my soul finds rest. How many of you need rest today? In God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. So I don't know what you're going through this day or how you feel, but no, what, no matter what it is, we can come in here and we can stand on the rock of God knowing that he's going to be with us and he's going to take care of us. And I'm super glad that you are here today. Especially if you're a visitor, we are so glad that you're with us today and we hope that you have a wonderful experience with us. So if you would just reach in front of you maybe in a few minutes and find one of those visitor's cards there, and just fill that out and place it in the offering plate so that we could just know that you're here with us today. We would appreciate that so much. Y'all, I can't believe that just a couple of days, it's November, right? <clears throat> Crazy. And, uh, but I'm excited. we got so many fun things planned for this month. And if you make note in the bulletin, in a couple of weeks, we've asked Adam and Teal uh, to come and do a worship service on uh, Sunday November 20th, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. We're going to celebrate Thanksgiving with them. And so I know that you'll want to be here for that and invite your friends. You'll see the collection dates. I got a note just a minute ago that there's over 150 boxes already in our windows. And so we look forward to seeing our windows filled with that. Thank you again for being here today. So glad that you're here. And uh, as we continue our worship, let's welcome somebody this morning. Would you stand? <laughs> Such a great time to be in the house of the Lord. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. We're going to start off by singing Days of Elijah. Oh 
sound is so good this morning. Let's continue to worship as we sing when we all get to heaven. just to be in your house this morning and we thank you for the gift of song and um, we thank you that we're just able to worship you and you, the, you, the, you are the almighty father and uh, father just as we sung what a day of rejoicing that will be when, when we all reach heaven we thank you for that promise and we thank you for loving us and I pray that you continue to bless this hour of service in your holy name I pray amen you may be seated <laughs>
On August 17, 1992, there was an article in a newspaper about a little girl who fell out of the window. She was four and a half year old. She fell from the ninth floor, it's 100 feet below. And we wrote in an article that it was a miracle. Believe it or not, but that girl was me. And I lived and I believe that God reached out his hands and caught me and laid me softly on the ground. I was born during a time when Soviet Union was falling apart and Ukraine became an independent country and many people were struggling financially including my family. I lived with my grandmother, mother and my uncle. My mother and uncle they had drinking problems. She would be drunk, she would get very violent. But my grandmother was a, a very hard-working woman and she took care of all of us, especially after my fall. So my grandmother was to me like my mother. My best memories uh, when she would take me to the village where she would plant vegetables and fruit so we would have something to eat. When I received a shoebox, I was 12 years old and it happened around Christmas time. One day at church around Christmas, our pastor said that today children will have a surprise. So I was very excited and curious, what can that be? Pastor said, today you are going to receive a shoebox gift for Christmas. It was a big surprise and there was a lot of excitement and I wanted that gift. When I saw what's inside, I was 
so happy. School supplies, I had hygiene items, soft toys. The very special thing was a letter from a lady who packed it. So when someone was translating it to me, they said, this lady wrote to you that I wish you a Merry Christmas and I pray for you and I love you. It was hard for me to understand why would somebody love me who doesn't even know me. Today, I understand that God wanted to show me the kindness of Jesus through that shoebox. I could not believe that all of these things were given to me and that they are new and they are now mine. <laughs> Looking back at my life, knowing that I fell and that I had a hard time growing up, I see that God never left me and that He always took care of me never took away his hand from me. It gives me hope to keep going even when hard times come in life. God is always faithful. God will never leave me and will always carry me through. I would encourage people to pack a shoebox for a child just like me. Through this shoebox, we can receive joy and hope and just to feel kindness of Jesus. It made a difference in my life and in my heart. And if you haven't grabbed your shoe boxes, there's some at the back of the church there. But I just want to thank Miss Nancy for leading us today. Miss Lynn was out sick, and so she stepped in, so thank you. And you got to do it twice. Excellent. So, so <laughs> excellent. So let's all stand together. Our offertory hymn is in Christ alone. We sing all four verses. In Christ alone, I hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. His cornerstone is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of
pray with me? Truly, Father God, here in the power of Christ, we will stand, Father. Stand in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in his holy name. Father, knowing that no power of hell, no scheme of man can take you away from us, Father, when we put our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you so much, Father, for that. And Father, at this time, we ask you to bless these tithes and offerings, Father. Um, use them as you see fit, Father, and how you know best to use them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Nancy, again, thank you for jumping in and filling in and uh, doing what you do. You do so much. And I just want to say it was so good to see Miss Joy up in that choir today. So proud that you were there today. If you have your Bibles, please take them and turn with me to Joshua 24. Joshua chapter 24. And today we're going to wrap up our study of, of Joshua's last chapter, looking at uh, Joshua 24:33. Where we'll use this one little verse as kind of a jumping off point for our time together this morning. Joshua 24, 33. Well, a while back, a Tahoma, Washington newspaper carried the story of Tattoo, a basset hound. Tattoo didn't plan on going for an evening run, but when his owner shut the dog's leash in the car door and took off for a drive with Tattoo still outside the vehicle, he had no choice. Motorcycle officer Terry Filbert noticed a pa passing vehicle with something dragging behind it. He commented that that poor basset hound was picking up and putting down just as fast as he could. He chased the car down to stop and Tattoo was rescued, but not before the dog had reached a top speed of 25 miles per hour, following down and rolling over several times. Now, I'm curious... How many of us today have felt like tattoo before? How many of us are living lives like that basset hound, picking them up and putting them down just as fast as we can, rolling around and feeling dragged about through life? Let me take a quiz and see how many of us have something to relate to, to tattoo the basset hound today. Fill in the blank with me. I'm ready to throw in the... I'm at the end of my, uh, I'm just a bundle of, my life has fallen, I'm at my wits, seems like we all have something in common with tattoo, don't we? For most of us, our challenges is that we have a busy schedule, our work schedules, we have student activities, families to take care of, we have hobbies that we want to accomplish and all kinds of sporting events we want to be to. 
and we have church activities. We have this and we have that, and it seems like we constantly fill our schedules and calendars to the brim until there's no place to stop and to rest. Well, when we get to the very end of the book of Joshua, we find a very important lesson, a very obscure, but a timely lesson on resting. So let's look at it together today as we read Joshua 24, 32. It says, And Joseph's bones with the Israelites had brought up from Egypt were buried at Shechem in the track of land where Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. Now at first glance, and here in this verse, maybe you were like when I was thinking, what is the deal with Joseph and those bones? Believe it or not, this is a pretty cool story from the Bible. The children of Israel had been responsible, and they had been carrying Joseph's bones around with them for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, do you remember Joseph's story? He was the guy that was the favorite son of his father. He was hated and beaten by his jealous brothers and was sold into slavery and falsely accused while he was in prison. But then, eventually, he becomes a dream interpreter and then a leader for Pharaoh where he saves most of the known world because how he manages the food during a famine. Joseph lived a long life. He had a long journey. And right before he died, he told his brothers, and he told his family and all his relatives, do not bury me here. There's another land that I'm going to, another place that is designed just for me. And so Joseph says, carry my bones. And now, here in this story, hundreds and hundreds of years later, from Egypt through the wilderness, and now eventually into the promised land, finally, Finally, the bones of Joseph come to rest. Now, the real cool thing about this passage is, if you flip over a few passages to Hebrew in the New Testament, the author of Hebrews tells us that this verse, that this story is a picture of the eternal rest that you and I will experience if we have our faith in Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us that there is a rest for those of us who have the promise of God. You see, as believers, the end of our journey is going to be a time of sweet rest. We often read and we talk and even sing about heaven, those streets of gold and those mansions Jesus built and is preparing for each of us, the thoughts of reuniting with our loved ones that have passed before us, we get excited about the worship that Jesus, with Jesus, with people from all over time and all over the world. Truly, truly what a day of rejoicing that will be when we see Jesus and we sing and shout that victory. And I believe one thing heaven will be is when we get to heaven, we will find rest. It's truly a time of rest. Now just think with me for a second. What would it be like to be in a place today where there's no stress, no deadlines, no schedules, no hurry, no hustle, bustle, no trying to get here and there, but we are constantly present and constantly filled with peace and joy and rest. So today, I want us to think of our rest here on earth as a, a taste or a picture of of the true rest that one day that we're going to experience with Jesus in heaven. You see, if we, all we needed was physical rest, we can go home in a few minutes and we can take a nap. If we need some emotional rest, you can find a place to go for a few days of vacation. But how can we experience true spiritual rest at the deepest level of our hearts and our soul? Well, as we wrap up our time together in Joshua, I pray that each of us would take heart this idea of true rest. I really think it's one of the most important principles, spiritual practices that we can be a part of. Well, how do we do it? How can we experience rest this week? I want us to look at two very practical reasons, practical ways this morning. First of all, someone once says we need to divert daily. We need to divert daily. 
First of all, we need to find a time each and every day that we are going to rest, to be silent, to get away, to get unplugged from this world. Luke 15, 5, 16 reminds us that Jesus himself often withdrew to a lonely place by himself. One version says the wilderness, and he prayed. I know for me, personally, the times in my life where I've experienced God in special and amazing ways, they have been times of rest. God says, be still, be still, and know that I am God. You see, when we rest, we are able to hear God in a different way. Uh, Prayers become more alive. The Bible jumps out to us a little bit more. It seems like the Holy Spirit inspires us in different ways when we take time to rest. So my suggestion is to all of us this morning is that every morning, before you grab your phones, before you check out social media, before you turn on the news, before you talk to anyone, before you cook or eat breakfast, before you go to school or work, I want to encourage you, each of us, to give our first 15 to God. Now, some of you could probably do more and do more, but most of us can at least give our first 15 minutes. Now, I like to call it with our young people, our first 15. Now, I've shared with you this before, but maybe this time will look something like this. Spend the first five minutes in God's Word. That's probably one chapter. Just five minutes in God's Word. The second five minutes will be listening or singing or reading or or hearing one of your favorite worship songs or hymns. Five minutes in God's Word, five minutes in worship, and then five minutes in prayer. Thanking God for the rest that you got the night before. Asking God to give you the strength for the next day. Your first 15, five minutes in prayer, in, in, in Bible, five minutes in worship, five minutes in prayer. And I believe if we can get into this habit each and every morning, then we're on our way to experiencing some kind of true rest. One of my go-to verses in life is Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What's cool about this verse is if you look at the literal meaning of those words weary and burden, if you put it together, it means work to exhaustion. So you could paraphrase that this morning by saying, come to me all who are worked to exhaustion, and I will give you rest. I like that. Lee Iacola was a a busy man running the Chrysler Corporation, and he understood the value of true rest. He said this, I'm constantly amazed by the number of people who can't seem to control their schedules. Over the years, I've had many executives come to me and say with pride, boy, last year I worked so hard that I didn't take any vacation. And he says, it's nothing to be proud of. I always feel like responding, you dummy, you mean to tell me that you you can take responsibility for an $80 million project? but you can't plan two weeks of the year to get some rest. And so many of us, aren't we? We know that we are worked to exhaustion. We are weary and we are burdened. And we know we need some rest today. But a lot of the time, we will choose to do anything or everything else to try to find rest instead of just coming to Him. But when you look at that verse... And we understand the promise of true rest. I have to ask the question, why don't we come to him more often to experience his rest? So that's the first way. The second way is to experience true rest is to withdraw weekly. So divert daily and then withdraw weekly. In the ancient days of Joshua, they had built in a a, a weekly rhythm, an actual something given to them by God. It was a word they knew as Shabbat. Shabbat is a Hebrew word that literally means to cease or to stop. And God thought it was a good idea, and the people of God practiced this idea that every week they would take a day, 24 hours, and they would celebrate Sabbath. They would rest. And Moses explains the purpose of the Sabbath in in Exodus 29 when he says, when God gave them the Ten Commandments, six days you shall labor... And do all your work, 
But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God created the world and everything in six days, and then he rested on the seventh. So for us, this idea of Sabbath means that we ought to withdraw weekly. That we got to get away from the hustle and bustle and of our busy schedules and all the stuff that is going around in the world. And we need to spend the day just in the presence of our Lord. And again, many of us understand that we know we need this kind of rest. But we put it off as maybe not as, as important as other things on our schedules. And it's not as necessary right now. But I believe God himself rested on the seventh day for a reason. And it wasn't because he was tired. He's God. He doesn't get tired. It wasn't because he was exhausted. But I believe that God rested on the seventh day for our sake. So that we would know that it is okay to rest. And that it is important. And that it is necessary. Now one of the top reasons I hear as I call people and check on them and, and visit people and they tell me uh, why they're not coming to church is that they're so tired. And they're so busy. I once read a, a letter sent from a, uh, to a pastor from a faithful member. It says, Dear Pastor, you often stress attendance at worship and Bible study as being very important as a Christian. But I think a person has a right to miss now and then. I think every person ought to be excused for the following reasons and the number of times indicated. Christmas, Sunday before or after, one. New Year's, party lasted too long, one. Easter, get away for the holiday, one. July 4th, national holiday, one. Labor Day, need to get away, one. Memorial Day, visit hometown, one. School closings, kids need a break, one. School openings, one more fling. Family reunion, mine and my wife's, that's two. Sleep late, Saturday night activities, we're going to say four. Death in family, four. Anniversary, second honeymoon, one. Sickness, for one, for each of the family members, that's five. Business trips, a must, three. Vacation, three weeks. Bad weather, ice, snow, rain, clouds, maybe like today, six. Ball games, five. Unexpected company, can't walk out on them, five. Time change, spring ahead, fall back. Specials on TV, three. And then it concludes, pastor, that leaves only two Sundays per year. So you can count on me to be on church on the fourth Sunday in February and the third Sunday in August, unless something unexpected comes up. <laughs> Sincerely, faithful member. Now I know that's a long, silly, exaggerated letter to make a point. But what if this morning, if I gave you a piece of paper and we really looked at our attendance, and how often we come to church. Just let's say the last couple of months, what would our average be? Would we be, say, 50%? But let's consider that average, that percentage of commitment to faithfulness to other areas of our life. Now, what if your car started 50% of the time? Would you consider your car faithful? If your cell phone kids worked half the time, would you excuse it by saying, oh, well, it works the other half of the time? If you showed up to work or school or practice 50% of the time, would your boss, teacher, and coach call you faithful? If you missed six of your mortgage payments in a given year, how would that go over? Now, if we show up to Bible study and worship 50% of the time, are we faithful? Maybe the story of Mary and Martha will help us put things in perspective. Jesus was traveling with his disciples, and a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary, and when Jesus arrived, Mary planted herself at the feet of Jesus and hung on every word that he was saying. Martha, on the other hand, was a little bit more industrious of the two, and verse 40 tells us, that she was worrying over the big dinner preparations, that in the midst of all her rushing around, she became frustrated with her sister and said to Jesus, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here 
while I do all the work? Tell her to come help me. But Jesus didn't tell Mary to help her sister. Instead, he rebu rebuked Martha. My dear Martha, you are upset over the details. There is really only one thing that be is worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered it, and I will not take it away from her. It just may be if we find ourselves too busy to come to church and to worship, maybe we're just a little bit too busy. The truth is today that many people are trying to find a way and escape from the life of busyness and meaningless, that they are looking for ways to get away. There's a new method in escape. It's called an escape room. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those escape rooms. You pay $30 and you join in with your friends for, that need to escape. You have about an hour to figure out codes in a room to try to get out of the room. Today, all over the United States, there's over, over 2,300 escape rooms. Experts say that people are trying to escape from reality. An escape room makes people think their lives are short in a world that makes sense. And can I give you a better suggestion this morning? Jesus came to, to this earth to make life meaningful and full and fresh and abundant. I mean, we are r related tightly to God and spend time with Him. Life is not an escape, but it's truly an adventure. You don't even have to find a room. God has given this whole beautiful world and your whole life to experience that. Now, most of us have been in a hurry our whole lives, hurrying to this, hurrying to that, Remember a kid, being a kid, pedal faster, then it was drive a little quicker, run harder. I wonder if I could have obeyed God's ancient command to keep the Sabbath day, to slow life down to a crawl and spend 24 hours with Him. You see, the Sabbath was created for frantic souls like mine and maybe yours, people who need to remember that God is in control. And the world's not going to stop if we slow down and rest. Maybe we need that reminder today. Uh, do our overflowing schedules have us drowning? This is why God insisted that we, take a, we set a day aside with Him for rest. He knows what we need. And if you're tired all the time, your body is telling you something. You need rest. You need rest. Fatigue comes in many forms. We need to renew emotionally and spiritually, not only physically. So instead of making time for everything else on your schedules, why don't we commit to slow down and to stop and make time for God first? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this wonderful reminder. Thankful for this picture and story of, of rest. And there's no doubt that just everyone in this room at some time in their life have felt just exhausted. And uh, God, we realize this morning that the answer to all our exhaustion, whether it's in our bodies, in our souls, in our spirit, in our lives, is that we need rest. And that rest needs to be in you. Father, we recognize that we can only experience true rest in simply coming to you, trusting you with our lives and being forgiven of our sins and experiencing your spirit with us each and every day. And God, I pray if there's someone in this room today that cannot experience true rest because they've never found that relationship with you, God, I hope they would understand that true rest only comes from you and they would commit their lives to you today. And God, maybe there's some of us here today, including myself, that we need some rest. We're tired of running from here and there. And God, we're trying to do it on our own strength. But God, we need to slow down, and we need to commit that each day we're going to rest in you. We're going to spend time with you. We're going to come to you with our burdens and our, and our, and our heavy loads. And we're going to allow you to give us the strength to handle those things. And God, I pray that 
as a church, our lives are so busy. Um, I don't know when in history that uh, we decided that we have to be doing something all the time to be living. But God, I pray that we would make sure that your church and the activities here, spending time with you, would be important, and that they would be a priority, and that we would choose to be faithful to you in whatever we're doing. God, help us to rest in you. In Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. As we close our time together this morning, I kept thinking this week of the hymn, uh, 486, Give Me Jesus, and I just pray that this today will be our prayer and desire of our hearts this morning as we stand and sing. Thank you for being here today, and I hope that uh, maybe in just a few minutes we can go practice what we've uh, heard and learned today. I uh, hope you have a restful and a great afternoon and a great week. Hope to see you next week. Russ, will you conclude us in prayer, please?